which Nietzsche is, right? And and here is the uh, devotee. The devotee gets to this point. The immoralist gets to this point. The immoralist actually has to make and entertain rational deliberation. What ought I to do based on pure reason, inferencing skills, you know, uh, appeal to uh, the best explanation, and so on. So the immoralist has a, a pretty problematic decision to make. Do I do this or that? And they need to be able to justify their decision based on reason. At the exact same point, the devotee has no problem in what he or she ought to do because the moral imperative or the religious law tells them, go X. So when they say go X, I go X. Right? There is no deliberation. So I, as a devotee, go through all of existence, all of my life, in devout obedience to the moral imperative, to the moral law. And what ends up happening? The designers of this system, the designers of this law, recognize that I create a system of complete conformity, and for those who don't conform, of justifiable punishment. And this punishment usually, typically, unfolds in acts of genocide. Do what we want you to do, do what we tell you is right, or die. It's that, it's that black and white. There is no in-between, right? And, and that's provided you're given an opportunity to conform. Sometimes your very embodiment is the, is the case for your extermination. And I do that discussion um, in a completely different lecture series. Okay, so uh, that's, that's another uh, method of understanding religious oppression, right? And as we said, um, you have to think rationally about um, the form of religious impression. It, it doesn't, in any sense, dissuade from your religious beliefs to admit that your religion has been and is being used, whatever your religion might be, to oppress others. I think it would make you a better believer, a more fervent, uh, more ardent believer, if you can acknowledge that your religion has done that in the past or is currently being used to do that, and from within your religious beliefs, try and change those manipulative aspects of the religion. Right? I think it it'll actually help. So this is not like uh, you know become an atheist lecture because I'm not an atheist. Right? It is a recognition that it's unfair, unfair and extremely dangerous to overlook the oppressive elements of your religion and your religious beliefs. Okay, so that's number four. And then lastly, number five, actually I think it's lastly, let me see. There might be one more. Yeah, last one, number five. Um, this is a quote from Nietzsche. This is uh, a few notes down. This is note 144. Very important to tie into this this notion of religious oppression. Number five, morality's religions, uh, morality's religions of the principal means by which one can make whatever one wishes out of a man. Obviously, designers, architects, can make whatever one wishes out of a man, provided one possesses the, and here's what's important, right? Provided one possesses the superfluity of creative forces, the creative energy, um, can assert one's will over long periods of time, right? So let's look exactly at that. I want to be sure I cited that right. 144. And of course I don't... Um, oh, it's the whole thing. Okay. Um, so 144, read it directly. Moralities and religions are the principle means by which one can make whatever one wishes out of a man. Right? So... How do we make what one wishes? How do we control men? Right? That's a good question. How do we control, make what one wishes? How do we control men? Right? How do we control men? How do we control men? How do we make what one wishes out of a man? Moralities and religion are the principal means. It's not to say it's exclusive, right? This is not a sufficient cause. It's a necessary cause. Morality and religions 
are the principal means by which one can make whatever one wishes out of a man. So how do we do that? Moralities and religions. Right? These two things are used to control men. Right? Moralities, systems of moralities and religions are used to control men. Moralities and religions are the principal means by which one can make whatever one wishes out of a man. Provided, there's a caveat, right? It's not just de facto. Provided, one possesses a superfluity of creative forces. So that the architects of these systems of morality, the architects of these religions, have within themselves a superfluity of creative forces. So that there's a creative force informing the individual. Provided one possesses a superfluity of creative forces and can assert one's will over long periods of time. So that this becomes it becomes an assertion of will. I use my creative forces, my creativity, my ability to create ideas, to be able to perceive things that others wouldn't perceive, and I manifest that creativity through an assertion of will. I'll say that again. I manifest that creativity through an assertion of will, and then I funnel that will, either through morality or religion or other forms of control, to control individuals. So it really is, if you think about it, if you think about it and you do sort of the logical syllogism follow way back, there really is a sense in which the more creative I am, the better story I tell, right? The more creative I am, the better story I tell, the more power I have over controlling people's lives, right? Two people, one person who's really, really pedantic, talks really, really heady, nobody understands, Another person who can talk eye to eye with the, with the layman, who's going to have more control over the layman? The person who no one can understand or the person who everybody can understand? The person who everybody can understand, right? Which is precisely the reason why the sacerdotal class is posited as the highest class, followed closely by the poets and the noble families, and then at the bottom are the masses. Because the sacerdotal class the elite class, in a sense, recognize that the level of discourse that they engage in, that they entertain, is too abstracted from the masses. The masses can't, not to be facetious, but the, the masses can't understand what we're saying. At the priestly class, at that level, we, we, we're, reading, um, we're reading Latin, we're writing in Latin, um, and it's very esoteric knowledge. But what we do is we can communicate our ideas to the poets. And the poets can take those ideas, coupled with their creative forces, and impose through religion control. Right? And that's what would happen. Right? That's what would happen. And this is the problem that contemporary artists and every artist finds, is that the artist wants to have creative control of his or her own work, but insofar as they want to have creative control, they don't have any money, but if you want to get subsidized by money, you have to give up some of that control. And insofar as you give it up control to somebody who has money, the reason why they want you is because now I want you to do what I want you to do. You're going to work for me. And that's how that works. So, uh, very, very key, very, very key uh, point. So, the five, the five um, structures of oppression. I know it was sort of dense. First structure is positing the priestly class as the highest class. Second is the power of the lie. Third is the fact that systems this complicated of oppression are intentionally designed. Number four is the influence of punishment and poisoning the system. The fact that individuals um, have corrupted the world. And then lastly, what we just discussed, the ability to use creative forces